Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to this midweek video. Appreciate you tuning in as always. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell here on YouTube as a way of staying current with the ministry. We go live from our assembly building on Sunday morning as well as when we create content for you here midweek. We would certainly appreciate that. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an alt tech site should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into alt tech sites or would just like an alternative to YouTube, please consider checking us out on Rumble as well. My featured books this week are once again <clears throat> my co-authored book, J.C. O'Hare and the Origins of the American Grace Movement. This is a co-authored full-length uh, featured church history book on J.C. O'Hare, an important figure in the history of American dispensationalism, the fountainhead of the mid-acts grace position. So if you are into the history of dispensationalism or would like to know more about this important figure, please consider picking up a copy of the book <coughs> on J.C. O'Hare. Also, my book on Bollinger, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. This is a little sketch of Bollinger's life with a emphasis and a focus on figuring out how and why and when Bollinger articulated and went into the Acts 28 dispensational position later on in his life after in the 1890s enunciating a version of the mid-Acts position. So both of these books are important books on figures in the history of dispensationalism. So if you're into church history or would like to know more about them, please consider picking up a copy of these books. We'd certainly appreciate that. Those of you that have been following the channel of late, you know that I've been pressing towards finishing my review and analysis of Daniel G. Hummel's book, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Time Shaped a Nation. We got like two chapters left in this. I'm going to record this and probably a video next week so that we can wrap up this before the end of 2023, which has been my goal over the last five or six weeks. So where we are right now in our analysis of the book is we are in, again, part three of the book, which is on pop dispens the pop dispensationalist, 1960 to 2020. And we find ourselves today in chapter 18, Collapse. So as always, Hummel has a bit of an introduction at the beginning of every chapter before he gets into the various subsections. The four subsections of chapter 18 are the Reconstructionist, um, Eschaton Redux, which is a, sort of a play on words a little bit, the Lordship Salvation Controversy, Deeper Cracks in, the, in Scholastic Dispensationalism, Progressive Dispensationalism, Baseline Fracture, and A Lonely Wake for Dispensationalism are the subsections for chapter 18. <clears throat> Chapter 18 begins on page 301, and so we will get right into the introduction to the chapter. <clears throat> Hummel writes, As pop dispensationalism advanced into American politics and popular culture, scholastic efforts to manage its reception had vacillated between mimicking pop dispensational outputs and critiquing pop dispensationalism as in insufficiently rig rigorous as far as its um, uh, intellectual and theological standards go. Excuse me, I'm a little bit of a <clears throat> frog in my throat here this morning or something. The former could be seen in John Wolverb's Armageddon Oil in the Middle East, 1974, and Charles Ryrie's The Final Countdown, 1982, to name a few books in the same popular style as Lindsay. With each attempt, though, the multimedia commercial reach and cultural influence of pop dispensationalism easily prevailed. The Scholastic's other approach was to criticize pop dispensationalism's sensationalism <clears throat> and accommodation to popular culture was harder to detect for outside from outsiders of the tradition in 1984 john wolverd then in the twilight years of his leadership of dallas seminary distanced his school from lindsay by telling christianity today that the popularized that the popularizer quote goes beyond our teaching wolverd further explained that pop dispensationalists like lindsay were inconsistent literalists preferring to interpret biblical prophecy in ways that accommodated modern military technology rather than maintaining a strictly literal approach. So I, I would I would side just frankly with Wolvert on that. I think that, you know, um, the book of Revelation particularly has been, you know, way over read into on the basis of modern technology in ways that um, 
don't, don't seem to make sense to me. But anyway, so I would stand with Wolvert on that point. Scholastics consistently leveled leveled that this line of critique at the popularizers of their theology. A few years later, Walver published a beefy reference book, The Prophecy Knowledge Handbook, 1990, in which he contrasted scholastic interpretation <clears throat> on all types of issues to that of pop dispensationalists. Once again, he was, he was concerned that popularizers had traded literalism for hype. The prophesied, quote, great war of Wormwood foretold uh, the fall from heaven blazing like a torch during the tribulation was not, as Lindsay maintained, a symbol for nuclear war, but, quote, a large naturally blaze, a large naturally blazing as it entered the atmosphere and apparently having chemi chemicals that made the water bitter. The prophecy was, in other words, to be taken as literally as possible. Likewise, Charles Ryrie, in a similar barb at popularizers, insisted that the plague of locusts of Revelation 9-9 was not a symbol of Apache helicopters or futuristic soldiers, or as pop writer Sam uh, Kerbon speculated, but in fact a plague of locusts. Okay, so imagine that. The plague of locusts is actually a plague of locusts, not Apache helicopters or something like that. So... In the 1990s, outside observers rarely remarked on these tensions. They preferred to emphasize the similarities among dispensationalists rather than understand their differences. Yet in doing so, they missed the significance of these internal squabbles. Scholastic attempts to correct pop dispensationalism signaled a, the a theological tradition in the midst of crisis of authority. While pop dispensationalism barreled into the 1990s on the momentum of commercial success, the scholastic credibility of dispensationalism was rapidly diminishing. By the end of the century, the tradition had more or less hollowed out its institutions and ceased to train a younger generation of theologians and pastors in the teachings of Chafer and Schofield. Look, that's largely true. I don't know if that's totally true. I think there are dispensationalists that would definitely disagree with that. Um, but I think there's a ring of truth to that to, to some degree in what Hummel just said. The collapse happened along multiple fronts. A resurgent faction of post-millennial fundamentalists going under the name Christian Recon Reconstructionists waged a vicious, print, a vicious print war with dispensationalists in the 1980s that left both sides battered and the targets of wider uh, operabum. At the same time, John F. MacArthur, the popular Talbot a popular Talbot Seminary trained author and megachurch pastor publicly broke with scholastic dispensationalism over what it meant to be built, quote, born again. His attack lock launched a decades-long lordship salvation controversy that signaled a broader defection of scholastic dispensationalism to covenant theology. Third, a scholastic revision to the tradition had become known as progressive dispensationalism, coalesced, coalesced at Dallas Seminary, in the 1990s and created a split between progressive and traditional dispensationalists. By the year 2010, a stunning state of affairs had come to pass. Dispensationalism looked to be on its last legs as a theological tradition. It continued to be taught in some sectors of fundamentalism and pop dispensationalism continued to churn out content that shaped religious culture, but the enduring theological legacy of dispensationalism was clouded in uncertainty. So, you have to understand something about Hummel's sort of analytical lens here, okay? He is analyzing dispensationalism from its scholastic um, vantage point as the brainchild of Dallas Theological Seminary and the influence that it had, okay? So the next, the first subsection is the Reconstructionist Eschaton Redux, Redux, page 303. Every fundamentalist needs a conversion story and a, a band of arch Calvinists, fundamentalists known as Christian Reconstructionists were no exception. Many of their leaders had grown up dispensationalists. From 1966 to 1975, I was a dispensationalist, wrote theologian, theologian Kenneth Gentry in his polemical House Divided, the breakup of dispensational theology in 1989. In a preface titled, Why I Could Not Remain a Dispensationalist, the one-time student of Grace Theological Seminary recounted how he had transferred to Reformed Theological Seminary, Jackson, Mississippi, after, after encountering 
Oswald Ellis's classic covenantalist critique of dispensationalism, already questioning his received theology, Gentry recalled that Ellis's, quote, prophecy and church, 1945, bulldozed the residue of his collapsed dispensationalism. When he arrived in Mississippi, Gentry yet Gentry had yet more theological road to travel. He began to disciple, he began to be discipled, sorry, by one of his new professors, Gregory Bashan, whose brief tenure on the faculty was defined by controversy. Bashan was dismissed from Reform Seminary for teaching these views, and these would be um, I'm sorry, I accidentally skipped a part. Under Besham's tutelage, Gentry began, quote, as a anti-theonomic amillennialist, but later he came out a theonomic post-millennialist. This technical language and symbolic drudgery were part of the charm of this corner of fundamentalism. Gentry had, em Gentry had embraced his teacher's positions on theonomy, a Christian political agenda seeking to rule society through divine law and post-millennialism, an, eschat an eschatological vision that sees such as divinely ruled society as preparation for the second coming. So this would be dominion theology. This would be we bring in the kingdom. We seize control of, of law and politics and education and economics and, and media and, and uh, all of these things, and then we establish this idyllic Christian age that then brings in the kingdom. Beshin had, was dismissed from Reformed, Theological, Reformed Seminary for teaching these views in 1979. But, but by then, both professor and student were part of the burgeoning theonomic post-millennialist movement known as Christian Reconstructionism. The leading lights of this movement were staunch Calvinists who embraced a robust conservative theopolitical agenda such as dominionism, also known as dominionism, like I just said. They included theologians Rushdi, uh, Rushdani and his son-in-law, a free market capitalist Gary North. Rushdani's think tank, the um, Chelsea Don Foundation, located in California, and North's educational organization, the Institute for Christian Economics in Texas, anchored the movement, which found a small incendiary following, especially among <clears throat> fundamentalist Presbyterian churches. Gentry's conversion story from dispensationalism was shaped by other leaders of the movement. North gladly admitted, I was an ultra dispensationalist in the early spring of 19, 1964, while Ray Sutton, pastor of the Reconstructionist Hotspot of Westminster Presbyterian Church in Tyler, Texas, had trained at Dallas Seminary. At the heart of their criticism of fellow fundamentalist Reconstructionists blamed the failure of the church to assert its God-ordained God authority over society on dispensational teachings that encouraged social quietism until the rapture. So they're saying that it's dispensationalism's fault that there's all this, these social and cultural problems because dispensationalism has said that you live a quiet and peaceable life, that you evangelize, that you edify people in sound doctrine until the rapture, and that is the primary goal and function of the church. So these dominionists are criticizing this. They're saying dispensational theology was not socially active enough. It should have been trying to maintain political power and seed political power through uh, the United States. And so they're blaming dispensationalism for being, quote, too hands off, too quiet, whatever you want to call it. Their movement's name was inspired by the project to, quote, reconstruct the American church to carry out this agenda and especially to rescue rank and file fundamentalists from their captivity to dispensationalism. As North wrote in 1989, Reconstructionists had worked for nearly a decade to, quote, flush into the open some dispensational scholar, not just a Hal Lindsey, but a true academic spokesman of the movement in order to provoke a confrontation. The Reconstructionist provocations did prompt dispensational responses, but never from a true academic spokesman. The strongest rebuttal came from Hal Lindsey himself. In his most scholarly toned book of his career, Lindsey took on Christian Reconstructionism in Road to Holocaust, 1989. The title, which implied the Dominion, which implied the Dominion theology movement in his potential 
in the potential deconstruction of the United States, the church in Israel was fittingly overblown for a debate among two small circles of fundamentalist theologians. Using the ill-advised metaphor of the Holocaust, Lindsay described Christian Reconstructionism as the most recent villain in a long history of Christian anti-Semitism. The trail from the third century church father origin to Auschwitz traveled through generations of um, superstitionist was perpetuate, uh, who perpetuated the false prophetic premise of the church and that it was the sole possessor of Israel's covenant promises as dissenters from the historic replacement theology that saw the church as the heir of Israel's covenant with God. Dispensationalists were largely exonerated on this count. So <clears throat> you have now this, this debate now raging between these dominionists and what's left of dispensationalism at this point, at least from an academic scholastic sense. Lindsay set the tone of um, our archimonious debate that both sides joined together. Pop dispensational writer David Hunt, Whatever Happened to Heaven, 1988, and Tim LaHaye's No Fear of the Storm, 1992, were defenses of the rapture that promised that the church's destiny was to avoid rather to overcome current political current politics and looming tribulations. Another pro-dispensational response was Dominion Theology, Blessing or Curse, 1988, written by two younger writers in the more scholarly mode, H. Wayne House and Thomas Ice. They concluded that Reconstructionism's that Reconstructionism posed undeniable dangers to Christians and to American society. Elsewhere, ICE proclaimed Reconstruction is to be, quote, the most dangerous trend within evangelical Christianity because, quote, the call for believers to exercise a premature dominion is at the heart of Satan's promise to Eve in the garden, unquote. The dispensational defense spurned new institutional building as well. ICE worked with Tim LaHaye to found in 1994 the Pre-Trib Research Center molded on the powers port court conferences in the early 19, 1830s. The center hosted a young gathering and produced a flood of publications combating Reconstructionists and postmodernists. Pre-trib members saw deep connections between the spiritualized biblical hermeneutics of the former and the epistemological relativism of the latter. For their part, the Reconstructionists advanced familiar lines of critique. Gary North wrote close to 50 books managed by his own Dominion Press and edited a variety of newsletters and journals, including <clears throat> Christian Reconstruction, 1977 to 1996, and Bible Economics Today, 1978 through 1996, with much of the attention after 1985 dedicated to denouncing <clears throat> dispensationalism. He popularized the reach of Dave McPherson, a journalist and ex-dispensationalist who spent decades attempting to discredit the origins of the rapture by tracing them to a mentally unstable teenage girl, Mar uh, Margaret MacDonald, who saw visions in 1830, and from whom John Delson Darby purportedly stole the idea of the imminent rapture. That is not true. I have videos on that. I have a whole, I have a three video series called uh, Darby on Trial, debunking attacks on the pre-tribulation rapture. I will put a link in the description to that playlist. You're going to want to check that out. In his books ranging from The Incredible Cover-Up, 1975, to The Rapture Plot, 1995, McPherson hammered the same conspiracy theory, even as non-partial experts found the scenario unlikely. The critique stuck in, in reconstruction, reconstructionist circles, however, and frequently and was frequently repeated. Still repeated today. All these this flurry of videos that have come in uh, onto YouTube in the last, say, year to 18 months, are almost always influenced by McPherson's conspiracy theories about where Darby got the idea for the rapture. Um, I will leave a link in the description for this video to the playlist, Darby on Trial, Debunking Attacks on the Pre-Trib Rapture. Historical origins played a role in another key area of the debate. Both sides charged the other with <clears throat> lack of pre-modern precedence for their theology, so long uh, and so long and so the long debate over provenance of millenary doctrine was reshaded once again, rehashed, I should say once again. Dispensationalists like ICE charged the post-millennialism po that post-millennialism 
did not develop until the writings of English theologian Daniel Whitby in the 17th century, while we, Reconstruction has pointed out that even later introduction of key dispensational concepts in the 19th century. Just as dispensationalists had mined the church fathers for precedence to their doctrine, so too did Reconstructionists, especially in his commentary on the book of Daniel, Days of Vengeance, 1987, Reconstructionist theologian David Chilton insisted that the earliest Christians were, were preterists who understood much of the prophetic material of the New Testament to have been fulfilled in the, in the first century, a scenario that accommodated the, uh, that particular strand of postmillennial eschatology advanced by Reconstructionists. So you can see here that there is a major now argument going on between the Dominion theologians and the um, dispensationalists. And this is where I do sort of, when I see certain things happening in our current politics about recapturing the seven hills of dominion, dominion theology, I see that being way more of a factor in what is going on currently in our current politics than dispensationalism. What Hummel's analytical lens is to pin all of it on dispensationalism or most of it on dispensationalism as we've gone through the book. Finishing sub this subsection, the heat subsided in the mid-1990s, but the damage had been done. The Christian Reconstructionists brought to light troubling trends in scholastic dispensationalism, its aging theological leadership, its um, shrinking Christian college footprint, its lingering weakness on historical and hermeneutical debates. Reconstructionists itself would never gain a broad popular following, Though its influence on some leaders, here it is, in the new Christian right, fascinated journalists, its legacy advanced half of what North had hoped, a scholarly struggle that cornered dispensationalists and removed some of the sheen from their theology's popular appeal. I would say this influence on the new Christian right is much more significant than what Hummel is granting. The next subsection is the Lordship Salvation Controversy, okay? Um, <clears throat> let's see here. So there's a lot of details here about people and summary and what's going on. And the, 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 the controversy about Lordship Salvation, we should look at the bottom of 308, He's still talking a little bit about this Reconstructionist, um, as vitriolic as the Christian Reconstructionist critique could get, it had ultimately failed to flush into the open a true academic spokesman of dispensationalism to engage in the debate. In 1993, North complained bitterly of, quote, continuing silence of Dallas that Seminary faculty in response to repeated broadsides by Reconstructionist theologians. These faculty have become theologically deaf, theological deaf mutes and poor defenders of their theolo theology, he concluded. Engaging with the likes of North was hardly an appealing proposition to the deans of dispensationalism, but their avoidance of this particular debate was more likely due to many other fires burning on the theological front. While Reconstructionists were lob lobbing their attacks, a growing number of Dallas-trained scholars were defecting into the broadly reformed covenantalist seminaries and churches. The trend was visible at the lay level with thousands of rank and file examples, but just as alarming with the scholastic were the scholastic defections. He gives two examples, Greg, Gregory K. Beale and Bruce Waltke, who are part of this uh, defection. On 308, he talks about... Um, the breaks of these guys with dispensationalism was confined to the scholastic and inner church chatter. More public was the departure of Sam Storms, a pastor and theologian who graduated from Dallas Seminary in 1997 and made his way into the Reformed and, Reformed and Charismatic leadership, including John Piper's Desiring God Ministries at the Reformed Church Planning Network and Acts 29. So that's a, a, a reform group. As an illustration of these diverse communities he represented, Storms also worked for a time in the charismatic apostolic prophetic movement 
a sprawling collection of pastors and churches headquartered in Kansas City. The apostolic prophetic movement embraced charismatic theology and rejected dispensational eschatology. In fact, the movement became known for its dominionist, here it is, seven mountains mandate teaching that pushed Christians to overtake the institutions and spheres in society as a preparatory work for the second coming. As a charismatic leader with the new covenant, new Calvinistic credentials, Storms moved out of premillennial circles, which, uh, which was the subject of his popular 2013 book, Kingdom Come, an amillennial, um, an amillennial alternative. So here we have the seven mountain mandate, this dominion theology again. Okay, it's coming up again, and it's going to gain more storm. Now, by far the greatest scholastic issue here is going to be the um, struggle with um, John MacArthur and Lordship Salvation. MacArthur's grievances when this, with dispensationalism were not with the church-Israel distinction or the imminent rapture, which he continued to teach. Rather, he complained about the long-time dispensational difference with Reformed tradition on the definition of salvation or being, quote, born again. The free grace salvation taught by Schofield, Chafer, and other dispensationalists featured a low barrier to entry into the saving grace of Jesus, sometimes called mental ascent salvation. The threshold was for an individual to make a simple intellectual or mental acknowledgement of the proposition that Jesus is Savior. A prime popular example of this free grace teaching could be found in Hal Lindsey's Liberation of Planet Earth 1974, which ended with an unadulterated free grace appeal. Let me tell you right now, if while you've been reading this book, you've said to yourself, this is true and I believe it, I don't understand it at all, but I believe and I, and, I, and I do understand, then I guarantee you, you've become a child of God. That was what Hal Lindsey said in 1974. So <clears throat> as a free grace person myself, I got a problem with that because it says nothing about believing and trusting and relying in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All a person needs to do to be saved is to acknowledge they're a sinner, to acknowledge they cannot save themselves, and to trust and rely exclusively on Christ's shed blood on the cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection as the only total complete payment for their sin, the way I end all of these videos, okay? Because that is the most important issue. Now, MacArthur is going to say, that's too simple. You guys have oversimplified the gospel. MacArthur took aim at this popular view, <clears throat> state, uh, stating with, <clears throat> starting with its preponderance in televangelism, <clears throat> by developing a larger critique of how dispensational theology in, um, enabled its spread. In The Gospel According to Jesus, 1988, this is the seminal book in Awaking the Lordship Salvation Controversy, which broke the debate into the open, MacArthur began by sketching <clears throat> the sorry state of affairs. It now appears that the church of our generation will be remembered chiefly for a series of hideous scandals that uncovered the rankest exhibitions of depravity in the lives of some highly visible televangelists. And wor as worrying as the sins of Jim Baker and Jimmy Swaggart were, MacArthur was more perturbed by the way, quote, conservative fundamentalist evangelical leaders had taught the rank and file Christians to respond or rather failed to respond. Most troubling of all was its painful reality that most Christians continued to view these disgraced people as insiders, not as wolves and false shepherds who had crept in among the flock. The problem plaguing Christians was not tribalism or theological ignorance, according to MacArthur, but an insufficient understanding of what was required to be born again. Christians, he warned, had have to be told that the only criteria for salvation have been told that the only criteria for salvation is knowing and believing some basic facts about Christ. He called this easy believism on page 196. If knowing was the only necessary condition of salvation, then someone could seemingly live a sinful life, but claim to be a follower of Jesus and still be born again, pages 16 and 17. In an era of pop dispensationalism, this free grace doctrine had come home to roost. The character of the visible church reveals the detestable consequence of this theology. Polling by Gallup revealed that close to one-third of all Americans consider themselves born again, which puts this matter on the forefront of public life. 
These figures surely represent millions who are tragically deceived, MacArthur warned. Theirs is a damning false assurance. By the time he had investigated the matter thoroughly, MacArthur identified the sources of free grace error as none other than the leading lights of scholastic dispensationalism beginning with Lewis Perry Chafer. The founder of Dallas Seminary was, quote, a brilliant man, MacArthur acknowledged, but he was also deeply flawed. Chafer pioneered a tendency among dispensationalists to, quote, get carried away with car car compartmentalizing truth to the point that they were unable to, that they make unbiblical distinctions. The dichotomy of law and grace that underpinned dispensational time was the excess that led to free grace heresy. By defining the current dispensation as one of, quote, pure grace, Chafer deposited free grace into the very core of the scholastic tradition. The position was not just Chafer's, Ryrie's, Ryrie defended it in so great salvation, uh, but none did more to promote free grace than Zane Hodges, a professor of New Testament at Dallas Theological Seminary from 1959 to 1986, who attacked the tradition, re traditional reform view that, a, that to be saved required not just belief, but active repentance from sins and the acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord. In his response to MacArthur, titled Absolutely Free, a Biblical Reply to Lordship Salvation, in 1999, he charged that MacArthur was teaching that what MacArthur was teaching led to a kind of faith slash work synthesis, which destroys only significant, which differs only insignificantly from the official Roman Catholic doctrine. So this is a major controversy now, and Chafer and the Scholastic Dispensational Tradition of Dallas Theological Seminary is directly lined up in the crosshairs of John MacArthur. And he goes, this is the problem, this free grace teaching that was purported at Dallas Theological Seminary. The Lordship Salvation Controversy, so-called um, so for the two sides disagreeing on, on whether salvation required acknowledging Jesus as Savior or as both Savior and Lord, spurred dozens of pamphlets, books, conference panels, and sermons. The controversy also attracted outsiders to dispensational conflict like philosopher Dallas Willard in his popular Divine Conspiracy 1998. Willard dedicated an entire chapter to diminishing the free grace position as little more as a gospel of sin management that reduced the idea of salvation to, to one of individual guilt and absolution. Willard rejected Ryrie's and MacArthur's narrow basis for the debate that being saved is a forensic or legal condition rather than a vital reality or character. And as yet, Willard admitted this view roughly uh, dominated the interpretation of salvation in evangelical and, cons and conservative churches in North America. Willard's outside perspective, sorry, my dog is scratching herself. Um, Willard's outside perspective highlighted the, contr the contraction of fundamentalist theological concerns in the wake of ongoing factionalism. So he goes on and he, he talks a little bit more about this. Like Bale, Wake, and Storms, MacArthur's charge in, in think, change in thinking began to be reflected in his affiliations. He became increasingly at home among the new Calvinist circles that shared his views on salvation. One of his first one of the first endorsers of the gospel according to Jesus had been John Piper, and it was through the vote of confidence that MacArthur and Piper struck up a lasting friendship. So this is going to cause now for there to be an eroding in dispensational teachings. MacArthur's critique continuing allegiance to the teachings like the church and Israel distinction made him a lightning rod in the ongoing scholastic defections from dispensationalism, suggesting that some dispensational teachings continued continued even as he leveled severe critiques on others but in the broader view he was not he was not that unique faced with a resurgent postmillennial and consistent attacks by ex dispensationalists the scholastic dispensational tradition entered the 1990s more weakened than it had been for decades but the rolling collapse had yet another turn and the most devastating one yet that tore at the roots of the tradition. Now he's going to get into progressive dispensationalism. Okay. Now, 
Progressive dispensationalism is going to be a break in the dispensational tradition that happens at Dallas Theological Seminary by many of its own professors. Okay, um, I'm going to say a little bit about this, and the reason I am is because I have an entire playlist here on progressive dispensationalism that I'm going to put a link to the description. This playlist goes through the um, development of progressive dispensationalism through the key books and, uh, and writers here that Hummel is going to mention. He says on page 313, by the 1990s, progressive dispensationalism had become a full-fledged school of thought, threatening to snuff out the, quote, normative tradition established by Schofield, Chafer, Walvoord, and Ryrie. The chief ar architects of progressive dispensationalism were three Dallas Seminary professors, theologian Craig A. Blasing, New Testament scholar Daryl Bach, and Old Testament scholar Kenneth Barker, and a Talbot, theolo a Talbot Seminary theologian Robert L. Saucy, or Susi. Barker and Susi were older, having been trained at Dallas Seminary in the 1960s, while Blasing and Bach were graduates from the 1970s. They all came of age during or immediately in the wake of the rupture in fundamentalist theology. They responded to the unsettled theological territory by revising, modifying, and altering the system of dispensationalism as it had been handed down to them. The rupture of authority in dispensationalism had finally reached the inner sanctum. The term progressive was a clue to how the younger generation of dispensationalists positioned themselves. The term was not necessarily polemical nor political, but was intended to define the newly understood relationship between dispensations, especially regarding the current dispensation, instead of the traditional view that the current dispensation uh, represented a, a parenthesis in God's redemptive history that postponed the kingdom, progressives asserted a fundamental continuity or progression from one dispensation to the next. Okay, So this is now the idea that the church of this dispensation is the inaugural phase of the kingdom dispensation, that the kingdom is being inaugurated by the presence of the church, the body of Christ, okay? Now, I cover all of this in this playlist, okay? And including how progressive dispensationalism impacted the grace movement through my former professor, Dr. Dale DeWitt, with whom I co-authored the JCO Hare book, okay? So there's a lot of things here that are important. Um, they, Hummel gets into great detail about the progressives and, and how they, um, sort of differed from what became normative or classical dispensationalism, uh, in the terminology, the stark dichotomy in the kingdom issue was, uh, replicated in other areas of scholarship throughout the 1990s from the church Israel distinction to the law of grace dichotomy. In each case, the commitment of progressive dispensationalists to find continuity where the traditionalists were emphasizing discontinuity shaped the debate. On a variety of fronts, progressives nuanced, softened, or erased category distinctions that had animated dispensational thought for more than a half century. Barker began a reevaluation of, of hermeneutical and doctrinal themes in the early 1980s, declaring in his uh, presidential address to the Evangelical Theological Society in 1981 that, uh, that, uh, that on the church-Israel distinction, we, dispensationalists, had compartmentalized too much. Bleising and Bach teamed up in the mid-1980s for a slew of articles in Bibliotheca Sacra that historicized dispensationalism and explored new areas of biblical interpretation. They introduced a contemporary hermeneutics which affirmed the literal earthly fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, but also allowed for multiple fulfillments, some of which may or may not uh, have been intended to the original utterance of the prophecy. So now there can be unintended fulfillment in, in this system. In 1985, theologian Robert L. Susi, his home, inst his home institution of Talbot Seminary hosted an annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society, the largest gathering of evangelical theologians in the country. Here, Susi wanted to expand the discourse around progressive issues and assembled a wide range of evangelical voices. The following year, he launched the Dispensational Study Group, which presented papers and met yearly alongside the Society's meetings, 
providing a venue for a regular and intensive exchange of ideas. By the early 1990s, book projects began in the study group, helped to formally coin the term progressive dispensationalism. <clears throat> the most distinctive contributions included the collective volume edited by Bising and Bach, Dispensationalism, Israel, and the Church. That's this book right here, Dispensationalism, Israel, and the Church, um, followed by their co-authored Progressive Dispensationalism right here, 1993, Progressive Dispensationalism, and Susie's uh, book, The Case for Progressive Dispensationalism. So when I put this playlist together here, I went straight to the sources themselves and read the progress, all the progressive dispensational material. Okay. Um, there's other books, uh, rightly dividing the dispensationalism, rightly dividing the people of God, 1995, the dispensational study group developed alongside this literature, um, inviting Poitras to its 1987 meeting. I think that is Vern Poitras, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it continued to host Reformed and Pentecostal scholars, among others. So this um, progressive dispensationalism is going to be forged now in the bastion of scholastic dispensationalism, and it's going to be a rethinking of the theology of the primary uh, architects of scholastic dispensationalism. Traditional dispensationalism continued to be taught in small pockets at Tyndall Seminary, Virginia Beach Theological Seminary, uh, Southern California Seminary, and Faith Baptist Theological Seminary, among others. It retained a foothold in other schools, though the early, though the early 20th, 21st century at uh, Colorado Christian University, Western Seminary, Moody Bible Institute, and the Master's Seminary, among others. The Conservative Theological Society, which published the Conservative Theological Journal, later remained journal of, renamed their Journal of Dispensational Theology, was set up to maintain traditionalist scholarship. So there's a lot to say here, okay? And I'm running out of time in this video before I'm going to have to end. So let's jump to a few conclusions from the last subsection, okay? So the lonely wake of dispensationalism. The Left Behind series was first, the first volume was published in 1995, would push pop dispensationalism to new heights of commercial success in the early 21st century. But as an organizing principle for religious belonging, dispensational theology started the new millennial, new millennium at a great disadvantage. So Hummel's saying you've got the pop dispensationalists have left scholastic dispensationalism. You have the dominion controversy. You have the Lordship Salvation controversy. You have the rethinking and the recasting of the dispensational die with the progressive dispensational movement. And so there's hard times for scholastic dispensationalism. And again, it's important that everyone realize that Hummel is only evaluating this through the lens of Dallas Seminary and scholastic dispensationalism. He's not saying anything about grassroots dispensationalism. He's not saying anything about mid-acts dispensationalism or you know, um, how, how people at the non-scholastic level, he's tracing the academic books, the theological movements, not necessarily what the people on the ground, what the boots on the ground are, are saying, thinking, and doing when it comes to dispensational truth, okay? So I'm going to go to the end, last paragraph of this subsection and of the chapter. Yet all this popular interest drew, uh, drew on rapidly depleting stories of historical resources, stores of historical resources. With little institutional support, the prospects for their replenishment were bleak. Pop dispensational culture, which is what overwhelmingly shaped evangelical churches and media, was poor sustenance for anything but populist and, and commercial folk religion. With the crack up of fundamentalist theology after the 1970s, dispensationalism was the clear loser. Forged in a moment of heightened introspection about the failures of fundamentalism, fundamentalist activism in the 1920s, dispensationalism could never escape its, fract its fractionist origins. 
which culminated in its marginalization later in the century as fundamentalist theology ruptured dispensational dispensationalism's theological de fate declined. The vacuum that accompanied scholastic dispensationalism's collapse extended across the wider fundamentalist and evangelical world, and this too is where the story of dispensationalism's rise and fall is the most uh, finds its most salient legacy today. So there's a lot to say in this chapter. Okay, we've looked at the Reconstructionist attack, we've looked at the Lordship Salvation attack, and we've looked at the progressive dispensationalist redefining dispensational theology in this particular video. Okay, now there's one chapter left surveying the aftermath, but it's really important that everybody understands that the rise and fall trajectory of Hummel's book is solely rooted in tracing scholastic dispensationalism. Okay, now I've already mentioned, I'm going to put a link in the description to this video to three video playlists on Darby on trial, debunking attacks on the pre-trip rapture. And I'm also going to put this lengthy playlist here about progressive dispensationalism, its development, its key ideas, and how it made its way into the American grace movement through the work of my former professor, Dispensational Theology in America during the 20th century, Dr. Dale DeWitt. So again, a lot of material, a lot of history, a lot to digest. Hope you're able to keep up and stay with me on some of this stuff. And avail yourself, though, of the extra material if you're interested in, in this information. God loves you. Christ died for your sin. Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross. He was buried. He rose again the third day. He wants to give you eternal life as a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't do anything to make you right before uh, God Almighty. You'll always be fall short of the glory of God. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into, into time, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, so that he could humble himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Trust Jesus Christ today, his death for your sin, his shed blood, his resurrection from the dead as the only complete payment for your sin. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.